musical accompaniment. Last summer, in an uh, idle moment, I was watching The Great Gatsby. And one of the characters, Jordan Baker, who is a sort of semi celebrity uh, professional golfer, she says this I like large parties, they're so intimate. At small parties, there isn't any privacy. And it struck me that's a bit of an odd thing to say. How can you have intimacy at a large party? So I went back to the book, and indeed, she does say this um, in the original novel. So I thought, well, what did she mean by privacy at a large party? She can't mean secrecy, because obviously people can see her, or the right to control information about herself, or the ownership of information. I don't think she kind of meant that. But I think it's more being free from worry about detailed scrutiny from other people. She can be in public in the sense of being observable, without being the focus of public attention. And we've heard earlier about this, this blurring between public and, pri and private nowadays. So I, th I thought, well, would she hold the same views today when we ourselves, and that includes everybody in this room, have become the most powerful privacy violators? Here's somebody doing exactly that. Uh, this was a story in the, uh, you know, in the Daily Mail about a man following a woman around a supermarket, taking photographs of her backside. She, f she was shocked to learn there was not much she could do about that. Um, I read a story in the Times recently about a couple stuck on an, um, an airplane that was delayed at the airport. Um, they were having a very public breakup argument with each other and their fellow passengers were tweeting the details of the breakup plus photographs um, uh, in real time. You might also have seen this website, it's called Women Who Eat on Tubes and this uh, is described by the creator of the, of the website as an artistic project. It's described by other people as voyeuristic stranger shaming. And um, this encourages people traveling on the lunch underground to take surreptitious photographs of women eating their sandwiches and other things, and then post them up online with various comments. So nowadays, our Jordan, if she goes to Jay Gadsby's party, she might update her anonymous blog she might send a Twitter message, perhaps unaware that that might indicate her location. Other guests might take photographs of her and use facial recognition technology to identify her, post messages themselves on Twitter. There might be a drone hovering ahead, overhead, live streaming to Periscope. People can read everything about her by just Googling her and finding all articles about her previous life. She might be outed by an internet troll as the author of her anonymous blog. So today, I think she would find the large party a lot less intimate. So does she have to accept that? She's concerned about the fact that there is a difference between expectations of privacy in the real and online worlds and the view that you know, if you make information available to the masses online, you can't expect to be named in any other situation. And should such a stark distinction still be regarded as valid? In terms of case law, the public-private dichotomy doesn't really offer her very much assistance. Um, I'll just talk briefly about this case um, involving a man called Mr. Huff, in, and this is a, a, an American case. Um, this was a guy that uh, was having a confidential conversation in his hotel room with one of his work colleagues about the sacking of his other colleague. Unfortunately, his phone had made a butt call, and the, the conversation was being overheard by the employee's PA, and she then reported all the conversation to the uh, employee that was going to be fired. 
Now, the judge in this case said that the person who operates a device which might grant access to others does not exhibit a reasonable expectation of privacy. And that's despite the case that this conversation was in a hotel room, in a place that the, the person thought was private, and he didn't expect um, the conversation to be overheard. So an example of the functionality of a technology dictating the resultant protection, privacy protection. We've seen this in the UK as well with this um, Nightjack case. This was an anonymous blogger who was refused an injunction to protect his identity because the judge said that the blogging was a public activity. He has no reasonable expectation of privacy um, in relation to information that might, might disclose his identity. Other cases have tried to take a bit more of a nuanced approach to privacy. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just mention this one here. This was a group of um, students that were involved in um, some political activity with a local council. They had a Facebook page which named them. And the case was about whether naming them on a Facebook page meant that they had lost any protection in their um, names and information in a freedom of information context. And the, the tribunal concluded in that case that they hadn't. So the, the, the law was able to distinguish between the use of information in one context and the use of it in another. So Jordan might not be very happy with the state of the law. She might think, well, can I, um, sorry, can I look at other ways of protecting myself using technology? She might think about personal data stores, technology that is being investigated by Digital Catapult um, here. She might think about Google Glass blockers to stop um, anyone wearing um, Google Glass from taking her image. She might think about a privacy visor. But all in all, she might conclude that these technologies do not give her the protection she wants in all circumstances. And she would just look ridiculous wearing those visors at the party. And perhaps more importantly, by continuing to shift responsibility on the individual, is this letting society off the hook? And I think the Baroness was talking about that earlier in her, um, in her uh, keynote. I've had to think about whether we can, whether there are alternative forms of law that we might want to consider. And this is my idea here, and I can talk to anybody a bit later in, in more detail about it, uh, of a new tort of the misuse of the online person, or might, we might call it the digital self, as we saw in the, in the video earlier. This would be an attempt to give people protection over information that is publicly available, um, but they, they want to keep some control over. So it would, it would um, acknowledge that it, this information is private, even though it is viewable. Um, it would prevent others from effectively re-identifying or creating new personal information from the information that they can see online. It wouldn't be an attempt to delete or hide information that's already in the public domain. So it would not regulate the taking of digital photographs per se or the posting of these online. So it wouldn't prevent women who eat on tubes of itself, but it would prevent the identification of the anonymous women portrayed in the photographs. These types of models, obviously not without um, issues, the determination of where the boundaries lie between your public persona and your job and your private self would cause considerable uncertainty. If we think about Jordan, um, there would be uh, a difference between her attending a family lunch, perhaps, and attending um, Jay Gadsby's party. So in my view, it is time for some new rules about social media, or as David Mitchell put it recently, the equivalent of the development of chivalry and table manners for cyberspace. Thank you. <laughs>